So it's going to be one-dimensional again. And we have A is going to be a constant. And so the equation that I write down is the most general way that I can write it down. So we're going to get x equals some number c1 plus some c2 times t plus some c3 times t squared. And notice, oh, I already erased my example. My example is gone. But you would have seen this was an 8 before. And here we had, uh, what did we have, minus... We had minus 6t, and we had plus 1t squared. So you recognize these three. I can now take the derivative, and so I get c2 plus 2c3 times t, and then I get the acceleration equals 2c3. And now we get some insight into these, qu these quantities. Clearly, x1, a c1, is the position of x at time t equals zero, for which we often write an x zero. Because when t is zero, that is where x is. c2 is really the velocity at time t equals zero, because when t is zero, that's when c2 is v. And the acceleration is not changing with time, is 2c3. Therefore, c3 is half the acceleration. So this gives you some insight in the meaning of these quantities. And you can see, you can read now some, some physics in there. c1, c2, and c3 can independently be either 0 or larger than 0 or negative. Makes no difference. Each one of these combinations is a valid possibility in physics. When we have gravity, an object is influenced by the gravitational acceleration. And the gravitational acceleration is a constant. And we write often for that gravitational acceleration the letter G. Whether I drop an object, or throw it vertically up, or I throw it vertically down, it's all one-dimensional, becomes two-dimensional when I throw it at an angle, I keep it one-dimensional, the acceleration is always the same. And that G, gravitational acceleration, in Boston is 9.80 meters per second square. And it varies a little bit for different places on Earth. This gravitational acceleration is independent of the mass of the object that I drop, of the speed of the object, of the chemical composition of the object, of the size of the object, and of the shape of the object, assuming that we have no air drag, assuming that these experiments are done in, in vacuum. Is it obvious that the gravitational acceleration is independent of all these quantities? By no means. Is it true? We think so. But I want you to appreciate that it is not obvious, and it cannot be proven from first principle. Remember last time, we dropped an apple from three meters, and we dropped another one from one and a half meters. And in your second assignment, which you haven't seen yet, I'm asking you to calculate the gravitational acceleration for me using these both experiments. And of course, I want you to also tell me what the uncertainty is in your final answer. And I'd like to help you a little bit to set it up and also to get these equations in terms of gravity. Whenever we deal with gravity, we get the g in there. So suppose here is the object at time t equals 0. It was the apple. And I call that position x0. I call that 0. I'm free to choose my 0 position. And I drop it zero speed. I just let it go, because that's the way we did it in class. The object goes down, zzz, and it hits the floor. Well, the general equations now, which deal in gravity, if I call this the increasing value of x, you can choose it differently. This is my choice today, is the following. x equals 
x0 plus v0t plus one-half g t squared. And g now is 9.80 meters per second squared. The velocity at any moment in time equals v0 plus gt, and the acceleration is constant, is simply g. Now, in my case, I have chosen t equals zero, x zero, is zero, and I've chosen this zero, so these go. And so you see that when the object is here, which is three meters below this point, and you know the time how long it took to get there, that you can now calculate g. Because x would be then three meters, that's when it's here. We made a measurement in class how long it took, so you know the time. And so you can come up with a value for g. And you can do that for both measurements. And of course, I want you to tell me also what the uncertainty is in those measurements. Remember that we derived last time that c, that the time that it takes for the apple to fall was c times the square root of h over g. And we never knew what that c was. I did a demonstration to show you that the time is proportional to the square root of h. We never knew what that c was. Now you know, because now you have the equations here, and you'll see that that c simply was the square root of 2. But I could not derive that from my dimensional analysis. Now, I want you to relax and at the same time get a little bit alert for a change. Look at this situation, v equals gt. That means when I drop an apple, and I'm going to drop another one today, that the velocity increases with time. So if I stroke this apple while it was falling, I would see the separation when it strobes to increase with time, because the velocity goes up with time. I have here an apple, or I'm going to put an apple up, about three meters from the floor. Three meters. So the height is three meters, approximately. We know from last time, remember we did it, it was about 780 milliseconds to hit the floor. I will just round it off and I think about it about eight tenths of a second, just to get an idea. If I flash, if I strobe it twice per second, we call that two hertz, so my strobe is two times per second, then I should hit that ball when it's falling twice with my strobe light. I don't know where it is, though, because when we strobe it and when I let the apple go, the two are not synchronized. So maybe the first time that the light blinks, it may be here, and the second time it may be here. But it's also possible that the first time it's here and the second time is there. And so the first thing I want to do is to test your alertness. We will blink. You will tell me where you see them. But we will take a picture. We will take a picture which will show us exactly where those two balls were. So that's the first alertness test.